Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk today about um, collisions, particularly one-dimensional collisions. We'll expand into uh, two- and three-dimensional collisions uh, next time. Uh, but we're going to talk today about uh, one dimension, collisions in one dimension, uh, get a basic understanding of what's going on with them, and why they can be useful. So, um, let's imagine uh, two objects colliding together, say a car accident of some sort. Um, and if you've ever seen a car accident, it's obviously a very messy uh, interaction where uh, two objects come together and they exert a great amount of force between each other and there's a whole bunch of bending of metal and screeching of tires and exploding of windows and so on. Um, obviously capturing all the details of that in a physics model is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, and generally, uh, we don't try very hard, uh, certainly not in the context of a course like this. But if we think about the forces involved in that collision, um, there are very, very strong forces between the two colliding objects, between the cars, um, for at least the very brief period of time where the cars are still pushing on one another and bending and breaking. Um, during that time, gravity still exists, friction with the road still exists, the drag force with the air still exists, the normal forces that uh, work on cars, um, but we can infer that the forces the cars exert on each other must be much larger than things like gravity and friction because gravity and friction and drag are all present while the car is moving down the road, um, but the car moving down the road by itself doesn't spontaneously uh, collapse into a bent mess of metal, whereas that's exactly what happens when two cars collide together. So clearly, the forces involved in that collision must, for the brief period of time that they're the collision is happening must be very much larger than the other forces involved uh, or acting on the car. Um, and so a, for collisions, for dealing with brief interactions where two objects will briefly smash together, um, we, we model this by assuming that uh, in that collision, in that interaction, the interaction forces there are much larger than the other forces acting on the uh, acting on the two objects. And so during that collision, we ignore the external forces acting on those objects, and it's just the internal forces. And because then in that in that approximation where we have two objects that are just interacting with each other, then the uh, the Newton's third law that we discussed last lecture means that the system of two colliding objects uh, must be a system in which momentum is conserved. In other words, that the total momentum of our pair of colliding objects before must equal the total momentum of the pair of colliding objects afterwards. And so the, the fundamental uh, tool that we will use in uh, dealing with these collisions is that we're not going to try and capture all the complicated interaction physics of two objects messily smashing into one another. We're just going to compare the moment just before collision, boom, and the moment just after collision, boom, and fill the gap or jump across the gap between those moments just before and just after collision um, by uh, conservation. All right, so uh, we usually divide collisions into uh, different classes uh, based on the, uh, the characteristics of how energy works during those collisions. In particular, um, for collisions where um, imagine, for instance, uh, a pair of uh, rubber balls, like super balls or things like that, hard rubber balls, um, uh, 
where uh, the nature of the forces between the two colliding objects is essentially something very close to the Hooke's Law spring force, which we saw was a conservative force. It conserves energy as the two balls squish against one another and then rebound. Um, in such a collision, not only is the total momentum of the system conserved, but also the total energy of the system is conserved. So the total kinetic energy of both objects will be the same before and after. That The sum of the kinetic energy of the uh, two objects before will be the same as the sum of the kinetic energy of the two objects afterwards. So that in other words, we're conserving not only momentum, but energy for elastic collisions. Um, so this is the case for, uh, you know, hard rubber balls bouncing against one another. Uh, even things like billiard balls are pretty close to elastic collisions. Or things like electromagnetic interactions or gravitational interactions, which can be modeled as collisions. Again, because the forces involved are conservative, um, energy will be conserved. Um, and even if energy, the forces involved aren't strictly conservative forces, in a large number of cases, uh, very little of the kinetic energy is lost. And so often it's convenient to model such things as uh, conservative for, or as con, uh, elastic collisions. Um, in contrast, an inelastic collision is just uh, any collision where that's not true, where the uh, energy is not conserved. Um, and indeed, there's a class of, uh, a subclass of inelastic collisions uh, where uh, the two objects collide together and then stick and form a single composite object. Um, and we call those perfect or completely inelastic collisions, where you have uh, two objects in, two objects enter, and one object leaves, basically, as uh, part of the collision. Uh, those are what we call perfectly inelastic collisions. And the way that you solve these various types of collisions are slightly different. For elastic collisions, uh, you conserve momentum, like we do for all of these collisions, but you also conserve energy. Uh, for inelastic collisions, momentum conservation is the only thing uh, we can apply. And for completely or perfect inelastic collisions, uh, we have to apply not only momentum conservation, but uh, a, a merging or combined uh, version of those uh, objects has to be used going forward. And let's... So let's start here. Uh, with a, an example sort of from astronomy and astrophysics here. It says, uh, Meteor Crater in Arizona, which is this thing pictured here, um, is a hole 180 meters deep and 1300 meters across. It was gouged in the surface of the Earth by the impact of a large meteorite. The mass and speed of the meteorite have been estimated at uh, 2 times 10 to the 9 kilograms and 10 to the or 10 kilometers per, spe or per second, respectively. That's 10 kilometers per second relative, basically, to the speed of the Earth. In other words, uh, we're measuring this from the reference frame of the Earth itself. Um, just before the impact, that was the, the, the velocity the, meteor, or the, crate, or the meteorite must have had. Um, and so, given this information, we can treat this as a collision. So we have uh, the mass of our meteorite here is 2 times 10 to the 9 kilograms, so 2 billion kilograms, and it was moving at 10, 000, or 10 kilometers per second, so that's 10,000 or 10 to the 4 meters per second. Um, the mass of the Earth is... 5.98 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And so we have uh, before we have our mass of our meteorite moving at some speed here of 10 to the 4 meters per second runs into this object, the mass of the Earth, which isn't moving. So that's before. And afterwards, we have the Earth with the meteorite stuck in its 
in its crust moving at some recoil velocity relative to the zero velocity it had to begin with. And so um, this is an example of a perfectly inelastic collision. And so uh, momentum conservation is going to look like this. We write down the momentum of the system beforehand. We write down the momentum of the system afterwards, and we equate the two of them. So beforehand, the momentum is the mass of our meteorite times the speed of that meteorite um, plus the mass of the Earth times zero, because it's not moving. So that term's going to go away, and that has to equal, on the, uh, on the other side, the combined mass of the meteorite and the Earth um, times our recoil velocity, whatever that is. That's what we're, cal that's what we're searching for. Um, and so uh, we're going to solve for the, uh, the recoil velocity, so we're going to divide both sides here by the sum of masses there. So the mass of the meteorite times the speed of the meteorite beforehand divided by the total mass of the meteorite plus the mass of the Earth is equal to our recoil velocity. Now, if we look, there's a huge disparity between the mass of the Earth, which is 10 to the 24 kilograms, and the mass of the, mass of the meteorite, which is only 10 to the 9 kilograms. There's, um, uh, well, there's, a le uh, there's 24 minus 9, uh, six, 15 orders of magnitude difference there. In other words, we would have to have, to detect this 10 to the 9, we would have to have this accurate to some 15 significant figures before we'd even notice that. So in other words, we don't really need to have uh, the mass of the meteorite in that denominator. Uh, because it's going to be totally swamped here by the mass of the Earth. So we can go ahead and plug things in. That's 2 times 10 to the 9 kilograms for the meteorite above uh, in the numerator times the speed of the meteorite, 10 to the 4 meters per second, divided by uh, the mass of the, technically the mass of the meteorite and the Earth, but in this case it's just the Earth really that counts times 10 to the 24 kilograms. And so if we take 2 10 to the 9 times 10 to the 4 and divide by 5.98 10 to the 24, what we get here is 3.3 um, times 10 to the minus 12 meters per second. 10 to the minus 12. So in other words, the Earth didn't recoil very significantly. Um, and the second part asks how much energy was released during that in inelastic process. So we could say then that the change in energy, well, that's going to be the energy after minus the energy before. Afterwards, what we have is the kinetic energy of, uh, technically again, the mass of the meteorite plus the mass of the Earth uh, times the, the recoil velocity squared. Again, this is basically just going to be the mass of the Earth. And beforehand, we had the motion or the, the energy of the meteorite moving, so one half mass of the meteorite times the speed of the meteorite square. Um, <coughs> so one half times 5.98 10 to the 24 kilograms and recoil velocity 3.3 10 to the minus 12 meters per second squared minus one half uh, 2 times 10 to the 9 kilograms 
times uh, 10 to the 4 meters per second squared. This first term, um, 3.3 3, 10 to the minus 12 squared times 5.98 10 to the 24 uh, times 0.5 10 to the minus 12 squared times 5.98 10 to the 24 uh, times 0.5. This is 33 joules of energy afterwards and uh, 10 to the 4 squared times 2 10 to the 9 uh, divided by 2 is 10 to the 17 joules. So there was 10 to the 17 joules of energy uh, in the meteorite, but the Earth only had 33 joules of energy afterwards. So in other words, the change in the energy is minus 10 to the 17 joules, um, which it asks us to express as tons of TNT. So one ton of TNT is 4.2 times 10 to the 9 joules. 0.2 10 to the 9. And so this comes out to be um, uh, 2.4 uh, times 10 to the 7 tons of TNT equivalent, or in other words, that this was the equivalent of a 24 megaton bomb when it smashed into the Earth. All right, let's try another example problem. So this one says, colliding stunt folk. A movie stuntman with a mass of 80 kilograms stands on a window ledge five meters above the floor. Grabbing a rope attached to a chandelier, he swings down to grapple with the movie's villain, mass 70 kilograms, who is standing directly underneath the chandelier. Assume, assume the stuntman's center of mass moves downward five meters. He releases the rope just as he reaches the villain. With what speed do the entwined foes start to slide across the floor? And if the coefficient of kinetic friction of their bodies is uh, 0.250, how far do they slide? All right, so let's start with a picture, often uh, a good place to start. So here's our stuntman uh, up here to begin with uh, on a window ledge of some sort. Um, and uh, this is at a height of five meters above the floor. Um, and our stuntman swings down like so uh, until uh, he, he reaches uh, the floor. Uh, then th he uh, collides with our villain. Here's our villain who has um, a curly mustache and a black cape, so he must be a villain. Um, and then uh, the two tangled bodies uh, slide across the floor. Where one of them has a mustache uh, and there's a cape and it's a mess. Uh, but they slide across the floor some distance, we'll call that D, until they come to a stop. So, um, this is a fairly complicated motion, and I can identify four moments of interest here. The first being uh, the stuntman just before he jumps off the window ledge. Uh, the second being the moment just before the stuntman collides with the villain. And the third moment of interest being just after the stuntman collides with the villain. 
and uh, the fourth moment of interest being when the two of them finally slide to a stop. So we have one, two, three, four moments of interest, and we're going to connect those moments of interest with different physical principles. So from moment one to moment two, we have our, um, our, our stuntman falling, and the only force that's going to be able to do any work is gravity, which is a conservative force. So we're going to use conservation of momentum, or sorry, conservation of energy, to connect moments one and moment two. Between moment two and moment three, um, we have a collision, and indeed it's a collision that ends up two objects collide, and then you have a combined object moving afterwards. So this is a perfect inelastic collision. at which we're going to conserve momentum. And then from moment three to moment four, um, we have essentially a uh, moving object has an initial velocity which comes to a stop under the influence of friction. Um, we can use this as a non-conserved energy problem. So we use work energy equation basically as the principle gluing uh, moment three and moment four together. So um, this problem here is actually the combination of uh, three physics problems kind of glued back to back to back where each one, the ending of the, each one is the beginning of the next one. So, if we're going from moment one to moment two, again, we're going to uh, conserve energy. So we say that the energy at moment one equals the energy at moment two. At moment one, our stuntman isn't moving, but he has gravitational potential energy. So mgh, and it's the mass of our stuntman, is the m there that's relevant. And at moment two, we don't have any... Uh, potential energy, but we have kinetic energy, so one-half the mass of our stuntman um, times whatever speed he's moving at at moment two squared. Okay, so energy moment one equals energy at moment two. Gravitational potential energy at the, in the window is the kinetic energy uh, down at the floor. Um, the two masses cancel out of this uh, relationship. And if we want to know the speed at which we're moving at moment two, uh, then we solve there for V2. Um, move the two over, so that's 2GH equals V2 squared. Or in other words, speed at moment two is the square root of 2GH, which is um, the square root of 2 times 9.8 meters per second squared times uh, 5 meters, so 2 times 9.8 times 5, uh, take the square root of that, and we get 9.9 uh, .9 meters per second. And that's the speed at moment 2. Now that's not what we were asked. We were asked what's the speed at moment 3, um, so now we have to go from moment two to moment three, and here we're going to use momentum conservation. So in other words, the momentum at moment two, well, that's the mass of our uh, stuntman times the speed of the stuntman at moment two, plus, well, the mass of our villain, but the villain isn't moving, so that term goes away, and then that has to equal, well, we have the combined stuntman and villain moving as one at some velocity v3. So that's the one we're solving for, uh, and we can solve for it by again dividing by the total mass here. So the mass of the stuntman divided by the combined mass of the stuntman and the villain times 
the speed at v2, or speed at moment 2, is the speed at moment 3. And so that's 80 kilograms for the stuntman, um, and 80 kilograms plus 70 kilograms for their combined mass times this 9.9 .9 meters per second. Um, 80 plus uh, 70 is 150 kilograms. Uh, 80 divided by 100, whoops, 80, whoops, divided by that 150 uh, is 0.533 and multiplied by 9.9 .9 meters per second gives us a speed of 5.28 meters per second just after the collision. Um, if we then want to calculate um, how far they will travel, so from 3 to 4, um, here we're going to use uh, work energy, so we can say that the work done is the change in the energy, and the change in the energy is the final energy, energy at moment 4, minus the energy at moment 3. Well, the energy at moment 4, we're not moving, so that's just 0 minus the energy at moment 3, that's 1 half combined mass of mass of the stuntman and the mass of the villain times their speed at moment three squared. So that's the energy that has to be essentially lost uh, due to friction. The question is uh, how do we calculate the work due to friction? Well, if we let's go ahead and move this over here. Um, and give ourselves a free body diagram. We'll just draw it as a box here. Um, we have a combined mass of the stuntman and the villain times gravity. That's the combined weight of the two of them. There's a normal force here, and then there's a kinetic friction force going backward if they're sliding to the right. Um, and so um, the normal force must just be the magnitude of the weight. And so uh, kinetic friction, which is mu sub k times the normal force, in this case is going to be um, mu sub k uh, times the combined weight of our stuntman and villain. Um, and so the work done then is going to be minus mu k times combined weight uh, times distance. The minus because the force is in that direction, but the displacement is in the opposite direction. And so the work done is negative. Um, and so we set up that the work is the change in the energy. So minus mu sub k times the combined mass uh, times g times the distance d is minus one half the combined mass times v3 squared and the combined masses will cancel and we're solving for d here uh, the negative signs cancel uh, so d is v3 squared over uh, 2 mu k times g and so um, that's 5.28 meters per second squared on the top, 2 times 0 0.250 times 9.8 meters per second squared on the bottom. So 5.28 squared divided by 2 divided by 
and divided by 9.8 gives us a distance um, of 5.7 meters. And so our combined stuntman and villain slide across the floor for 5.7 meters after colliding. And again, our strategy to solve this problem, we drew a picture, we identified uh, the physical concepts that could be applied for each of, or between each of our four moments of interest, used conservation of energy to connect moments one and moments two, used a perfect inelastic collision, so momentum conservation to connect moment two and moment three, the moment immediately before and immediately after the collision, and then used a, the work energy theorem to connect moments three and moments four. All right, so these have so far been examples of inelastic collisions at work. Let's uh, look at an example of an elastic collision in one dimension. So uh, here the problem says a cue ball of mass m1 equals 0.37 kilograms is shot at another billiard ball uh, with mass m2 equals 5, 0.585 kilograms, um, which is at rest. So we have a moving ball here, we're going to call that mass 1, which is equal to 0 0.37 kilograms, um, and is moving at an initial velocity, v1 initial, of um, uh, 5.5 meters per second. Um, and it collides with our object here, mass 2, which has a uh, mass of 0 0.585 kilograms and an initial velocity of 0. Right? So this is our before the collision picture. And after the collision, same two balls moving at unknown velocities. So m2 and m1. And the question is, uh, what are uh, the velocities here? The final velocity, uh, or the final velocity of the second uh, ball and the final velocity of the first ball. That's what we're looking for. And uh, we're going to get there by assuming that this is an elastic collision and therefore conserves not only momentum, but energy. So if we start with momentum conservation, um, that means that the momentum before must equal the momentum afterwards. So the momentum before we can write down is m1 times the initial velocity of object 1 plus m2 times the initial velocity of object 2, which in this case is going to be 0. So that second term uh, goes away. And on the right hand side we have uh, m1 times its final velocity, whatever that is, plus m2 times its final velocity, whatever that is. Um, we can go ahead and simplify this a little bit. Let's draw, or divide both sides by m1. So v1 initial equals uh, v1 final plus m2 over m1 v2 final. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and solve then for v1 final in terms of v2 final. So uh, that means we move this term over to the left. So v1 initial minus m2 over m1 v2 final is equal to v1 final. Um, and we can go ahead and plug in what we know of this equation. Um, so that's 5.5 meters per second 
for uh, v1 initial um, minus the ratio there of 0.585 kilograms divided by 0.37 kilograms times whatever the final velocity of ball 2 is. Um, and so our V1 final is 5.5 meters per second minus um, 0.585 divided by 0.37 is 1.581 times V2 final. And we're going to go ahead and put an asterisk there. Um, because we've taken this about as far as we can without involving our second constraint. And our second constraint is energy conservation. Um, where we write down the energy before and the energy after and equate them. So beforehand, we had one half the mass of ball one times its initial velocity squared, so that's the kinetic energy of ball one before the collision, plus one half m2 initial velocity of ball two squared. And again, because the initial velocity of ball two is zero, that term goes away. And on the other side, we write down one half m1 v1 final squared, the kinetic energy of ball 1 after the collision, plus 1 half m2 v2 final squared, the kinetic energy of ball 2 after the collision. Um, so we start with four energy terms. Um, one of them in this case went away because one of our objects didn't have any kinetic energy uh, to begin with. Um, we're going to proceed kind of like we did before. We can get rid of all these factors of a half. Um, and let's go ahead and divide everything through by mass 1 as well. So that leaves us on the left with just V1 initial squared uh, is equal to um, V1 final squared plus mass 2 over mass 1 times v2 final squared. <coughs> and indeed, we know the ratio of mass 2 over mass 1, we calculated it up here, is uh, this one, v1 final squared plus 1.581 times v2 final squared. <coughs> um, We know the initial velocity of uh, object one, uh, and we have we could go ahead and plug in this relationship for the final velocity of object one, and so let's go ahead and do that. Um, so we can say uh, that v uh, v one initial that's. 5.5 meters per second. We're going to square that. Um, must be equal to um, this squared, so 5.5 meters per second minus 1.581 v2 final. Square that whole thing uh, and then add it to 1.581 v2 final squared. Um, so we then have to expand out uh, that 5.5 squared here on the left. This is 30.25 meters per second squared, meters squared per second squared. Um, uh, to expand this out, that's going to be 5.5 times 5.5. So in other words, this 30.25 meters squared per second squared again. And then twice 5.5 times minus 1.58. So 5.5 times minus 1.581 is minus 8.69. Uh, and then double that. <coughs> 
because we have two cross terms. So minus 17.391 V2 final, and then uh, plus 1.581 squared plus 2.50 V2 final squared, and then plus our 1.581 V2 final squared. Um, now we need to continue our calculation here a bit. So um, uh, the two 30s here are going to cancel with each other. And let's go ahead and move the minus 17 over to the other side. So 17.391, uh, the units of that are going to be, this is meters per second times a quantity. So that's meters per second uh, times... Uh, v2 final is equal to, we can add these two together, so 2.5 plus 1.581 gives us 4.081 uh, times v2 final squared. Uh, we can cancel that v2 final with one of the v2 finals on the other side. Um, so 17.391 meters per second is 4.081 times V2 final. Or in other words, uh, take the 17.391, uh, divide it by the 4, and that gives us a V2 final of uh, 4.26 meters per second. And now we can go back here and say V1 final is 5.5 meters per second minus 1.581 times our V2 final, which was 4.26 meters per second. So times um, minus 1.581 and then add that to 5.5 and we find that our V1 final is minus 1.24 meters per second. So um, the velocities are, as I've drawn them here, one of them is negative, that the first ball actually rebounds backwards uh, and the second ball goes forwards. Uh, and this is the only solution that will conserve both momentum and energy of that collision. Now, um, it turns out that we can actually calculate uh, the, uh, the generic result. We can calculate uh, the general result of any two um, objects colliding elastically uh, in one dimension along a number line. Um, by just walking through completely symbolically the combined constraints of uh, co conservation of momentum and conservation of energy. So here we can start with energy conservation, uh, by which we say the kinetic energy of both objects before the collision must be the same as the kinetic energy of both objects after the collision. Um, and we can expand those out as one-half mv squared terms, two uh, to begin with and two to end with. And uh, we can get rid of the common factor of a half. Um, and now we can collect mass one terms on one side and mass two terms on the other side. So we're going to move the mass one terms to the left, so that's going to be mass one we got the V1 initial squared minus V1 final squared. And then doing the same for the mass 2, we have the mass 2 final squared minus, uh, or mass 2 times V2 final squared minus V2 initial squared on the right. Um, so we take that relationship. Um, and notice that both of those are, the, both of those velocity terms are the differences of squares, so we can write them as a minus b times a plus b. So we've expanded these both out as squares. So we have three terms on either side, uh, a factor of mass, 
and two factors of velocity. One is the di difference of velocities and one is the sum of velocities. And we're going to leave that there. So box it, put an asterisk on it, uh, and we'll leave that there and come back to it. Next we're going to write down a momentum conservation equation. Um, which says that the mo total momentum before the collision is the total momentum after the collision. Um, so uh, individual M M1s and M2s uh, over here. And like we did before, let's combine the mass 1 terms on the left and the mass 2 terms on the right. Um, and now we can notice that on the left here we have mass 2 times uh, v2 final minus v2 initial, which is also the same thing we have up here. So we could take this and substitute it in for those two terms there. So in other words, we could take the m1 difference of velocities on that side and replace it over there. Right? So we notice that those two things are the same. We then rewrite our start equation, replacing this term with this term like so, and then we can cancel the first two of those terms on both sides of that equation, and we're left with just this statement about the sum of the velocities. The sum of the velocities of object 1 must be the same as the sum of the velocities on object 2, which in itself is an interesting result and often is useful in calculating one-dimensional collision problems. Um, uh, we can also then just solve this, for instance, for v2 final uh, by pulling this over to the right. And so we have v2 final is v1 initial minus or plus v1 final minus v2 initial. So I'll save that one and plug it back into our momentum equation. Uh, and we expand out the v2 final from our momentum equation and now we can collect the velocity terms. So we have v1 initial plus uh, 2 v2 initial m2 and v1 final and then solve for v1 final here by dividing everything by m1 plus m2. So that is the, uh, the general form for any one-dimensional elastic collision of the final velocity of object 1 in terms of the initial velocities of object 1 and object 2. And we can plug this solution back into our previous saved equation for velocity 2 and derive a similar, after a little bit of algebraic manipulation, derive another equation for uh, velocity 2's final velocity, or ball 2's final velocity, or object 2's final velocity. And here we have two great big ugly algebraic equations that re represent the general result for any one-dimensional elastic collision. If you, know, uh, if you know the initial velocities and the masses of your two colliding objects, then you can calculate the final velocities. And indeed, you can use these equations if you know any four of there are six quantities, four velocities, initial and final velocities of the two objects, and the two masses. If you know any four of those six, you can calculate the other two from this pair of equations. You can also write this pair of equations in terms of the total mass. Now, these are extremely ugly and not particularly easy to memorize. They will be on your equation sheet for the exam, but uh, if you happen to have these equations handy, then you can use them instead of going through the process we just did for, um, uh, to calculate our results. For instance, we could just use this result uh, in the case of the, or in the context of the problem we just solved. So we would say that v1 final, well that's going to be v1 initial, which was 5.5 meters per second, um, times object 1's mass, which was 0.37 kilograms, minus object 2's mass, which was 0.585 kilograms, uh, divide by the sum of those two, so 0.37 kilograms plus 0.585 uh, 
kilograms. That's this first term there. And the second term is multiplied by the, velo the initial velocity of object 2, which in our case was 0. So that second term is going to go away in our case, plus 0. Um, so uh, this is 5.5 meters per second times 0.37 minus 0.585 is minus 0.215 kilograms on the top and 0.37 plus 0.585 on the bottom, 0.955 kilograms. And so uh, 0.215 divided by 0.955 uh, times 5.5 gives us our minus 1.24 meters per second for V1. which, yes, indeed, is what we calculated there. And V2 final, we could just plug it in here again. That's uh, initial velocity of object 1, so 5.5 meters per second, times twice mass 1, so twice 0.37 kilograms, over our summed mass, 0.37 kilograms plus 0.585 kilograms. And again, the second term here depend, or is multiplied by the initial velocity of object 2, which in this case is 0. Um, and so we can take our uh, 0.37 plus 0.585, that's the point, 0.37 plus 0.585, that's our 0.955 on the bottom. Uh, multiply it by 2 times 0.37, um, and multiply by 5.5, and that gives us 4.26 meters per second is our V2 final which is also the answer we got there. So, yes, indeed, these equations uh, work, can work in lieu of uh, the way that we went about it here. Sometimes these are simpler. Uh, sometimes uh, it's not necessarily worth your effort. And you can always just remember, cons or con uh, conserve momentum and conserve energy. Um, let me do warn you, you have to be careful about the sign of these velocities because pluses and minuses are important. In particular, um, we plugged in uh, pluses for this, right, and a zero for that, and because of the ratio of the masses, we got out a negative velocity for, for object one. Um, if we knew or uh, the final velocity was negative for one of these things, then we would have to plug it in as a negative number. So the sign coming out of these velocity terms has to be uh, the correct one, plus for in the plus direction, minus for in the minus direction. All right, so let's go ahead and do one last example here uh, of an elastic collision, um, and it says you are at the controls of a particle accelerator sending a beam of 1.5 times 10 to the 7 meters per second protons uh, of mass, proton mass, at a gas target of an unknown element. Um, your detector tells you that some protons bounce straight back after a collision with one of the nuclei of the unknown element. All of those protons rebound with a speed of 1.2 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Assume that the initial speed of the target is negligible and that the collision is elastic. Find the mass of our unknown element. So um, we have our situation here that we have our proton mass um, moving at some initial proton velocity, which is uh, 1.5 times 10 to the 7 meters per second and colliding with our x particle of mass mx, 
which isn't moving at all. So this is our before picture. And afterwards, we know that our proton is rebounding at a rebound speed here of minus 1.2 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. Minus because it's going in the opposite direction. That's our proton mass. And our x mass is moving at some velocity vx. This is our after picture. And um, we can then use our solution here. V1 final. Well, V1 final, that's going to be V1 is our proton. So that's going to be our rebound velocity is equal to uh, V1 initial. That's our proton velocity times mass 1. That's our proton mass minus our unknown particle mass divided by the sum of proton and our unknown particle plus V2. So that's the x particle's initial velocity, which is 0. So again, like we saw in the previous problem, that, that second term is going to be 0. Um, <coughs> uh, and so uh, we can say uh, we know the, uh, the initial proton velocity. We know the final proton velocity. And we can use this then to solve for the unknown particle's mass in terms of the proton mass. So let's go ahead and just multiply here by the denominator. Uh, so we've got the sum of masses times the recoil velocity equals uh, the difference of masses times uh, the proton velocity. And we'll go ahead and expand those out. So mpvr plus mxvr equals mpvp minus mxvp. Um, and let's collect the mx terms on the left and the mp terms on the right. So we have mx times vr plus mx vp, so that's taking this one and moving it over to the left, equals mp vp and then minus mp v recoil. Uh, and then we can factor out the common masses. So this is mx times vr plus vp equals mp times uh, vp minus vr. Or in other words, that mx is equal to mp times vp minus vr over uh, vp plus vr. And now we can go ahead and start plugging in our numbers. So that's mass of the proton times, well, Vp is 1.5 times 10 to the 7 meters per second minus negative 1.2 times 10 to the 7 meters per second on the top. And then on the bottom, uh, the 1.5 times 10 to the 7 meters per second plus negative 1.2 times 10 to the 7 meters per second. So on the top we get 1.5 minus a negative 1.2 gives us 2.7 times 10 to the 7 meters per second on the top. On the bottom the 1.5 plus negative 1.2 gives us 0.3 times 10 to the 7 meters per second on the bottom, uh, and uh, that in turn gives us a 0.27 divided by 
is 9. So that the x particle is 9 times uh, the mass of the proton. Which is what we were asked to find. Express the, an or the answer in terms of the proton mass. And if we wanted to know the speed of, ma of the, pro or the, the uh, mystery gas particle, the mystery particle immediately afterwards, then uh, we can whoops, solve for V2 here. Vx, that's our final velocity of our second particle, is equal to uh, the initial velocity of our first particle, so Vp times now twice the mass of our proton divided by uh, the mass of our proton plus the mass of our x particle. And we just said that the x particle has a mass of 9 times the proton mass. Um, this second term uh, here again, the V2 initial term goes away because the x particle didn't have any velocity to start with, so plus 0 again. This is just the second of these equations uh, written down for our particular problem here. Uh, so this is Vp uh, times uh, twice the mass of the proton on the top, and the mass of the proton plus 9 times the mass of the proton on the bottom. So that's uh, 2 over 10 uh, times Vp, or in other words, 1 fifth of the proton velocity. Uh, so the x particle has a speed of 1 fifth times fifth. Uh, times 1.5 times 10 to, the 10 to the 7 meters per second. So 1.5, 10 to the 7, uh, divided by 5 is uh, 3 times 10 to the 6 meters per second is the speed that the X particle moves at. All right, so there are some examples of uh, inelastic and elastic collisions in one dimension, and next time we will look at uh, two-dimensional uh, collisions uh, and also explosions, which are kind of perfect inelastic collisions in reverse, and uh, do some examples as well.